we make sense of everything we sense, taste, touch, smell, see and hear through pattern matching. If you went into Richie's there this morning, <coughs> you know, did to buy some grey tape, it would have had a barcode on it and it would have been scanned by an instrument that sent what that code meant to a data bank that said, yes, grey tape, $2.75. All right, that's this thing in physics called pattern recognition. Now, the scanner doesn't know anything. All it does is read it and send it to where it is known. The code doesn't mean anything to anybody else. It just means that the scanner reads it, sends it to where it's recognised, and that's what it is. The brain is doing something very, very similar. It's called pattern matching. Very important. Roger, some of you know Roger, he was three years old and he got on his hands and knees and there was a string of hairy caterpillars crossing the footpath. And he was mesmerised, never seen these things before. And he looked up and said, hey look Dad, there's a train. And he'd never seen caterpillars, but it made sense to him because it's pretty similar to Thomas the Tank Engine in terms of childish pattern matching. He's learning. Now he has a library of patterns now and he's got all the distinctions between caterpillars and trains. If he doesn't, you better stay away from the crossing. But what he was saying at three years old was there is a train-like thing, right? Now, we're doing that all the time. It is like, right? Pattern matching. Some important dimensions to it. We're not talking memories. It is not something we remember <coughs> because it's below the level of awareness. The woman on the left there is a, was a charge sister at Andy on Hospital and she said to me once, you know, every time the helicopter comes in, I break out in a sweat. Now she's not remembering her triage nurse days in Vietnam. She's not even thinking about that because patterns aren't memories. Patterns are far more primal and here's a response to an emergency situation that it's reading by the beat of the helicopter blades, right? So you're all, sorry? Where do those patterns get formed? Or what le I mean, are we still, are we still create new patterns? All the time. Yep. Certainly during infancy yep. and adolescence, pattern matching, which we're making sense of our world. We're really on a search. Mm. You know the why questions? Why is the sky blue? Why is it so far away? Why this? Why they're trying to make sense of their world and patterns are being formed. My dear old mum, used to come up from a little unit in the backyard about sundown up to me and she'd ask me, Charlie, are the horses away? The fading light, because patterns are affected by very subtle stimuli, and the fading light was enough to trigger a whole lot of patterns of security, of threat, of darkness, of being vulnerable. Sundown syndrome, if you work with aged care, especially in the dementia wing, it just sweeps through the whole wing. People getting agitated. Why? because the light is changing and at a primal level the patterns are all to do with security. Patterns are not memories and they can be triggered by very subtle things. If you drive between Cobden and Camperdown, which I used to do in 2002 and pick up one of my students to take him in there to the class because he was working on a dairy farm but he still wanted to continue at Adult Ed because we were going to charter a couple of yachts and go sailing around the Gipsy and Lakes, and he wasn't going to miss out on that quid. So between Cobden and Camperdown, there's a herd of cows. You'll notice them there on the right-hand side, and they're all big black Frisians, except one of them is a Jersey. And it is still the case. Yes, I often watch, where's that Jersey? And it's there, I don't know how you'd have it. Because farmers, if they are Frisian farmers, they tend to not like them. Jersey. I know one guy who says they're German. But anyway, we're sitting there waiting for this big herd of Frisians to cross the road. Just waiting for them to cross. And then this one Jersey walks across. And this student, I'll say his name is Peter, he says, look at that Jersey, the sulky little bitch. I hate him. I says, why? Uh, as soon as you put them in the bale, they piss on you. He <laughs> says, do you mean to say that Frisians don't ever do that? Oh, they do, but they don't mean to do it. <laughs> as true as I stand here, absolutely his version of absolute reality. I mentioned it later in class because it's a classic example of pattern matching. His pattern was formed in a state of fear and anger, and he is, it's locked in now, and it's absolute true for him. I said in class, 
just exactly what Peter had said while we were coming to school this morning. And he arcs up again. Well, they have an arc. <laughs> Isn't that bigotry? Isn't that race, racial prejudice? See, somebody of a Middle Eastern origin and you're associated with, mm. with images of twin towers. You know that at a rational level they probably had nothing to do with it and feel just as upset about it as you, but at a pat primal pattern matching level, that's the sort of connection that is made. Mm. Below our level of awareness. Two more to go. Interesting thing happened in Adelaide some time ago. A man was given a, a horizontal shuffle lost his job, was given another one as administrator of the Adelaide Cemetery. And he took it up with such passion that he found that there's over 30,000 graves here and the mothers don't even know where their babies are buried. These are infant babies. They come direct from the hospital. Stillborn, deformed, whatever. 32,000 of them. He thought, this is extraordinary. I'm going to find out who the babies are and contact the mothers, the good who say. And that's exactly what he did. And in that process, he talked to two old grave diggers. And he said, what was this story? What was the process? And the old grave diggers, one of them died by the time they got to interview him. And he said, the van would pull up. They'd only ever send eight or ten at a time. They'd keep them in the morgue until there were a few of them. And the van would pull up, and there were little cardboard boxes. And we'd put the box one at a time on our wheelbarrow, just as we were wheeling our grandchildren for a ride. He'd wheel them across to the, the grave they dug, and he said, you know, we dug a big grave, and we always put sand on the bottom so the little kids could play, and we always put the coffins in a circle so they're all facing each other, so they'd all know that there was somebody else there. And the extraordinary thing is, he is saying this as though this is... Absolutely, we did it for 30 years. This is how we do this stuff. And I never filled a grave in without having somebody to officiate. Isn't that extraordinary? Mm. What it is, is that patterns, when they're formed, <coughs> leave us with no choice but to say this is absolutely true. That old grave digger couldn't work out why that would be seen as anything significant. What, what are you, why is it such a big deal? We say it's a big deal because it doesn't make any sense. The kids are, are dead. They won't be getting out to play with it. Do you see what I mean? At a rational level, but patterns are not intellectual. They are, they are primal. I keep using that word. They are at a very base level. And the way in which humans interact with other humans, even humans that have never actually lived, doesn't make any difference. These aren't just little bits of meat. These are little babies and they were treated with such incredible respect. The impact of what that meant, he got an order of Australia for having put the mothers in touch with where their babies were buried. And you can imagine the process, and especially the fact that this was the way the grave diggers did their job. Now, I use the example because it reinforces this notion that a pattern matching gives you reality. It's not an intellectual reality. It may not make any sense at an intellectual level, but to the individual, it is absolutely not negotiable. Well, it can be, and certainly there's an example of it. Years ago, I built an aeroplane, and it's on a CV that I have online that I once built an aeroplane, and a guy rings me up, Peter McDonald, a retired airline pilot in Coffs Harbour. He says, I notice you build a wing ding. He says, I'm about to buy one. Tell me about them. I said, marvellous little aeroplane, if you're going to buy it, buy it and hang it in your shed, don't fly it in fear, sir. So. Oh, I said, why? Anyway, I got to talk about why I'm no longer involved in aeroplanes. And what I'm doing now doesn't take me much to get fired up about talking about human humans. I mentioned something about pattern magic. He said, you know, Merv, that's an incredible thing, because when I was at primary school, the inspector came in. He said, I remember it distinctly, that he had this big collage and it had people at the beach and motorbikes and boats and cars and cities and tents and mountains and all sorts of stuff on it. Just a magnificent big collage of interesting stuff. He said, I want you to have a good look at it. So he held it up there in front of us. And he rolled it up. He said, I want you to write down where the aeroplane was in that picture. 
and 52 kids wrote down where the aeroplane was and he unravelled it and there's no aeroplane there at all. Uh, and Peter MacDonald was, was only ever interested in aeroplanes. Aeroplanes are his life, so he knows that there was an aeroplane there and he saw it. He knows what sort of aeroplane it was and where it was. And here it was not there at all. He thought it was some weird trick of magic that he took the aeroplane off it until I talked to him about pattern matching. Pattern matching can make things real when they are not real. It can be absolutely true, as it was for Peter McDonald, probably still is, and yet it's not true. But the pattern, all it needed to do was where was the aeroplane? Well, the brain soon gives you a pattern of an aeroplane and puts it on the collage and says, there it is. And you've got no other way of saying, is this real or is it not real? Because the pattern is the only reality you have. Now, it doesn't mean that we wander through life saying, is this real or is it not real? Not at all. But we do need to be aware that we're making, we're forming a reality based on a process that we now understand, a process of pattern matching. If we're looking to affect change, effective change, well then we need to do it at changing the perception of reality. How do we do that? <coughs> By understanding of pattern matching. Making sense? <coughs> You've seen the movie Shine? Mm -hmm. David Helfgott? His wife is a potter. And she was building a new uh, pottery on their place in the uh, northwest coast, New South Wales. And David walks in this morning and he says to Jane, <coughs> who, who are these men out here? She said, they're the builders. They're building my new pottery studio. Who, who owns this place? She said, we do. We've lived here for four years. How's that? Had no concept of ownership. Remember, he's never lived anywhere. He's always been in institutions or in motels. He was a concept pianist who travelled the world and he, he was always looked after. So he didn't own anything. And he finds himself in a place now and he has no concept of ownership. So he asks those questions. Julian knows him well, so he's got a big bit of butcher's paper and she drew David and the piano and music notes, treble clefts and you know, the rest of it, Robin, all those things. And then she drew stick figures all lined up and then dollar signs on top of every stick figure. These people came to hear you play the music. They paid the money. All this money was collected, put in a big bank here. You draw it all out in paper, graphically. Remember, you're working with pattern matching. You want to work with images. That's all you've got. Language and thought doesn't cut it, not at this level. You're using them as a vehicle, but you're doing imagery. So it all was laid out in front of him. He was playing the piano, people paying the money, going into a block, into this big building. And then it was all put out of there into the hands of these people who used to live here. And they've got the money and we've got the farm. And he got up from the table, he put his fingers in his overalls, he said, well, in that case, I'd better go and have a look at it. And he went out and he was gone for three quarters of an hour. We are walking around as though he was about to buy it. And in a sense, he was. He was looking at it for the first time through the eyes of ownership. Do you know what problem we have with Indigenous people? They don't have patterns for ownership. Mm -hmm. They have a completely different mentality about if that's yours, is that your jumper treble or not? It, it's, it, it, we we yeah. live very much on ownership. They don't have those patterns. No wonder there's a mismatch. So David Helpcroft not only had a look over his farm for the first time four years after he bought it, he's the clincher. From that point on, he made the bed and did the vacuum. <laughs> The girl, butcher's paper. <laughs> <laughs> if you've had teenage boys, you're probably going to have one room of the house that's never very tidy because they don't have patterns for tidiness. And you can get exasperated and do all sorts of things and it won't make a scrap of difference. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to them. How do people make sense of things? By using patterns, there's no other way. So if you really want to impact change, and I suspect you do, if you are people that team seem to attract other people that, that need to talk and you want to do more than talking, it's at pattern matching level where the change will be effective.